A rather lengthy and multi-part question, but really the key words in this question is work, and then later on we talk about energy because work and energy comes hand in hand. Once you see these words, work and energy, you should be thinking conservation of energy. We've discussed in class already that conservation of energy doesn't make energy any magical. In fact, it makes it very much not magical. When things are conserved, you can basically keep track of it over time. What do we mean by that is you might have some amounts of energy in the beginning, energy one, and then in between some time, if you track all the work that is done on the system or by the system, then you have some amount of energy too. Because energy, very similar to mass and most things we know, doesn't magically appear or disappear. And that's what conservation actually refers to, that if you don't add or subtract from your system, it stays the same. It's a very intuitive idea. We can relate the total energy, which is a combination of your kinetic and potential energy. So this is your initial and final, and you can relate these two numbers by tracking all the changes that happens in between. And the amount of energy change is done by work. More specifically, these are work that crosses the system boundary and also classify as what we call non-conservative. Non-conservative meaning we're not tracking the work with a potential energy. So for our course, if it's not a gravitational force, not a spring force, elastic potential energy, we're going to treat that as this work term. So to facilitate all that, usually approaching these problem, we kind of draw a before picture for situation one and after picture for situation two. So in this case, we have situation one, cart, and we kind of know how fast it's going. And then situation two, you still have the same cart, but now it's, it's gone through a displacement of 20 meters and also it's constant speed. So V2 is equal to V1. So in these before and after picture, we're just focusing on describing the situation at that instant. And sometimes I also like to collect things in a little chart to help me keep track of the many numbers that's involved. In this case, I have speed, which is some unknown V1 and V2 is the same, so I'm using the same V. And for gravitational potential energy, we usually track the H, and in this case, you can define them to be both at zero because it's on flat ground. One side note here, they specifically talk about speed, so it's possible that the car would have changed direction during this whole thing, but energy has this nice thing of taking away some of the two-dimensionalness of some of these problems, and that's one of the strength of using this energy approach. Now, to get the change, we have to track all the work that is done between time one and time two. And to do that, we have to track all the forces that is on the body throughout this time because, of course, you might remember that work is force times your displacement with a cosine theta term to reflect that the force must go in the same direction as the displacement in order to change your energy. So that's why we still draw a free body diagram to track all our forces. And the forces that are on this cart, you have a frictional force. Assuming it's going forward, we have a frictional force acting that way. And then the, the shopper also pushes that away. And then otherwise, you're on the ground, so you have some kind of Fn and some kind of Fg. So then now you can answer the question one by one, going in turn, part A, we want the work done by friction. When we talk about friction, we have our friction force that away, our displacement is that away, so this angle here is 180 degrees. So that's my theta, so when we need to work out the work term, we have the friction force times my delta D, these are all just magnitude, times my cosine 180 degrees, and that's going to be negative one. So you got 35 newtons times 20 meters, negative one, so we get negative 700 newton times meter, which we define as a joule unit of energy. 
So really quickly, the work done by friction is negative 700 joules. Negative meaning it takes energy out of the cards, trying to slow it down. Let's clean some of this stuff here. Part B, they're basically going through all the forces one by one. So we got Fg like this. Our delta D is still like that. The angle here, theta, is equal to 90 degrees. And so when you do the work calculation, even though normally we track this through potential energy, you have this cos 90 term. Cos 90 is zero, so the whole thing is zero. Which is also reflected in the fact that our potential energy, mgh, is not changing. Now for the Schopper, well, we have the Schopper force and then cosine theta, where the Schopper has a force in that direction, delta d in that direction, and we know this angle to be 25 degrees. However, we don't know the specific size of the force, so we can't use this right now. What we have to do is kind of work backwards and use energy consideration to find out the work that way. So here's our entire kind of energy balance, and we have to kind of deal with these terms one by one. In this case, it's kind of nice in the sense that the kinetic energy before and after, because your V1 and V2 is the same, these are the same thing, so we can cross those out. They cancel each other. They're on the same height, or you can say they both have height of zero, so those potential energy is also gone. And you get this to be equal to zero. So what's left here is the non-conservative work term. Basically, you have to include every single one of your forces other than your forces that we have potential energy for. So we don't have to include gravity, but we do have three other forces here. You got the shopper does some work, plus the friction does some work, plus your normal force does some work. Now for the normal force, very similar to part B, once again we have this 9 degrees and cosine 90 degrees is equal to zero, so we know that part is zero. We already work out that this frictional force in part A is negative 700 joules. So whatever is left, this unknown here, is a shopper's work. So solving, we get 700 joules. Which makes sense because in order for you to maintain the same speed, keeping the same energy, it's no surprise that the shopper has to put in the same amount of work that friction is taking out. So now that we have this work term, we can work backwards to find out the force that the shopper exerts. You have joules, which is newton times meter divided by meter, you get newtons back. Answering the question, just a quick note, of course you could have done this part D as well using sum of forces because you know the acceleration is zero and then you can solve for things in the I and J component. But that's just mathematically a little bit longer, so energy can sometimes help us make the math a little easier, and that's one of the strengths of the approach. In part E, we just want the total work on the cart, which is over here, so it all adds up to zero. Makes sense, because there's no network done on the system, therefore the total amount of energy stays the same before and after. 